grab a cup of coffee, sit back and listen to Change Your Attitude, Change Your Life. Change Your Attitude, Change Your Life features stories to inspire and motivate you. Live your best life now. Listen, learn, think, and decide. Change Your Attitude, Change Your Life. Visit CYACYL.com. Welcome to Change Your Attitude, Change Your Life. I'm Joan Herman. Thanks for tuning in. If you're of the mindset that your life is predetermined by your genes and DNA, then stay tuned for this life-changing interview. Our guest today, Dr. Bruce Lipton, a former medical school professor and research scientist, is an internationally recognized leader in the new biology. His groundbreaking research can lead us to the belief that our bodies can be changed as we retrain our thinking. Dr. Lipton contends that our thoughts can activate changes in the activity of the cell membrane and therefore alter our health and life. Dr. Lipton is the best-selling author of The Biology of Belief and Spontaneous Evolution. Good morning, Dr. Lipton. Good morning, Joan. Thank you for this opportunity. Thanks for joining us. Dr. Lipton, everything that I read in the book, The Biology of Belief, it makes so much sense to me, and I really hope that our listeners at the end of this interview walk away with this knowledge that they can apply to their everyday life. Well, this is the, the, the most exciting part of the evolution that we're all experiencing right now, and that is... Uh, a return to self-empowerment. In the early days of your career, you were moving along and you were teaching and conducting important research, but on a personal level, you were not happy. What was going on in your life and what was your thought process like at that time? Well, I, had, I guess I was very successful on my professional level, and, and yet in my personal level, I never could find that satisfaction, that love, or whatever it was that I was seeking that was in some you know drive, internal drive, we're looking for something that what I call today the honeymoon effect, and, mm-hmm. and, uh, and, and I, the, you know, the harder I tried, the, the worse things got, and I then became much more of a laboratory recluse and hang out there because uh, I wasn't doing that good, and, and basically, uh, I didn't understand it. I just contributed it to the concept, oh, that's just a fate in life, and that's just the way things work out. It turned out that's not true. Bruce, whenever we talk about genes and DNA, people get turned off. They think that this is going to be something so deep that they'll never be able to understand. So in very simplistic terms, how is it possible that on a physical level, our thoughts can alter our life and health? Well, it's actually wonderful because the basic research I did is understanding is extremely simplistic. And it basically was, I was cloning stem cells back in 1967, about 44 years ago. So I was really way back there few people in the world knew what stem cells were. I put one stem cell in the Petri dish by itself. It would divide every 10 to 12 hours. So first there was one, and then there were two, four, eight, 16 cells. And over two weeks, I get thousands of cells. And then here's what the experiment was. I would take this large plate with thousands of cells and split the population up into three different tissue culture dishes and provide uh, three different culture media, which changed the chemistry a little bit of the culture medium in each of the three dishes. Now, the point about this is the, the cells were cloned, meaning all the cells in the Petri dish were genetically identical because they came from the same parent. Now, I put all these genetically identical cells in the three Petri dishes, but I changed the environment ever so slightly in each dish. And in one dish the cells form muscle, the next dish the cells form bone, and the third dish the the cells form fat cells. And if you ask the first major question, it says, well, what controls the fate of the cells? And and it's so simple. The fact is this, well, they were all genetically identical. So the first thing is this, you can't say that they had different genes or different genes were responsible at that point. The only thing that was different was the environment, the culture medium is what the cells live in. Now you say, well, okay, that's interesting. Uh, what does that mean? I say, well, the environment controls the genetics, the response of the cell to the environment. And, and then you go, well, uh, that's nice. Cells in a Petri dish, big deal. And then I go, wait, when you look at yourself in the mirror and you see yourself as a single person, that's a misperception because in truth, a human body is made out of about 70 trillion cells. The cells are the living entities. So when you say me, you're really saying a community of cells. But the way I would look at it, here's an uh, interesting way, is your body is the equivalent of a skin-covered petri dish, because inside your skin is a culture of 50, you know, 50 trillion cells. So why is this relevant? Because whether the cells are in a plastic petri dish or a skin-covered petri dish, that doesn't make the difference. What makes the difference is what is the culture medium? And I say, well, in the petri dish in the lab, I put the culture medium in. I say, what about in the human body? I say, oh, 
the culture medium is called blood. Blood, the composition of the blood, the chemical composition of the blood, like the chemical composition of the culture medium and the plastic dishes, the chemical composition of the blood controls the genetics and fate of the cells in the body in exactly the same way that the culture medium controls the fate of the cells in the dish. Now it comes to the next level and it says, well, what controls my blood chemistry? Where does this chemical difference occur in the blood? Because remember, chemical differences in the blood affect different genes. Well, it turns out it's the brain that releases the chemicals that control the genetic activity of the cells. And the significance about that is, is as you change your perception of the world, you change the chemistry of the blood. But you can feel that in your body as you perceive the world. If you're angry, you have a whole different feeling about in your body than if you're feeling in love. Uh, what you're actually is, is that the, the mind perception of love, the mind perception of fear, let's say, is connected with a brain chemistry that, that changes. So uh, if I open up my eyes and I'm in love, um, the chemistry that comes out of my brain includes things like dopamine, which is the pleasure chemical that you feel through your body, oxytocin, which is a bonding chemical that uh, tries to keep you attached to where that source of that pleasure comes from. Uh, and then you're also releasing your body things like serotonin and growth hormones. Well, if I added those same chemicals to my Petri dish cells, the, they would start to exhibit exuberant growth and um, take care of themselves, maintenance of the cells, and uh, the activity would increase the energy of the culture. And so basically I say, well, you know, those same experiences uh, that the cells have in a petri dish that humans have, that's why when you fall in love, you feel so healthy, you have so much energy, your biology is running great. And that is because when you're in love, the chemistry the brain releases is, is very supportive. And then in contrast, I say, well, if you all of a sudden become afraid of something, I say, oh, you release totally different chemicals. You no longer are releasing those uh, pleasure chemicals and growth supporting chemicals. You start releasing what are called stress hormones or inflammatory agents and why is that uh, important because in a state of fear you want to change the function of the body very very importantly because in growth you're sitting there just open taking things in assimilating life and growing but in fear you you shut yourself down and protect yourself and you get ready for fight or flight uh, because you're protecting your life. That's a the response to a fear perception. So the relevance about the, uh, the fear is that what happens is the chemistry that comes into the body in fear shuts down the mechanisms of growth and shuts down the immune system uh, to conserve energy to run away from whatever that threat is. So what's the point? The point is this. Our thoughts or perceptions about the world are translated into chemical secretions by the brain. The secretions go into the blood, which is the culture medium of the 50 trillion cells in my skin-covered Petri dish, and the composition of the culture medium now controls the genetics, and this is a new science. Uh, when I first was doing research on this 40 years ago, there, this was not a scientific field. There, there was no awareness of it. But in today's world, in the last 10 years especially, this is the basis of a new science, how the environmental chemicals control the genetic activity, and rather than the genes controlling the chemistry, it's the chemistry that controls the genes. Why is this relevant? You change the chemistry by changing your perceptions, and when you change your perceptions, you change your genetic activity. And all of a sudden, why is this important? And it simply comes down to... When I was teaching in medical school while doing this research, I was teaching something called genetic determinism. Your genes control your traits. Now, science doesn't really go there anymore, but the public is still getting the same old story that, oh, the genes control this and the genes control that. And it's like that is a fake understanding. It is not true at all because genes don't control anything. Genes are blueprints. It's the chemistry of the environment that selects the blueprints. And now we find that same chemistry in the environment not can only select a gene blueprint, it can modify the readout of a gene. And, and, and in fact, the way you respond to the environment, which results in the chemistry in your blood, that differential in chemistry can take one gene, which is a blueprint, and create 30,000 variations of products from the same gene blueprint point. I was teaching something called genetic determinism, genes control your life. That's victimization. That's what we were teaching people. You're a victim of your genes. You didn't pick them. You, you can't change them, and they control your life, and therefore, uh, you know, your heredity is really controlling the unfolding of your own life. And the new science completely goes the other way around. It says, no, you can 
change the genes which ones you have. You can change how they're expressed. You can change the, the readout of these genes all by changing your perceptions and responses to the environment. And so the new science is mastery of your biology. This happens on a much deeper subconscious level, doesn't it? Well, that's the big issue. The, the first thing is we think we're running our lives with our conscious minds, and, and those are the very, that mind is the important one personally because that's the one that has our identity, our spirit, our source. We are, by definition, like the emanation of the conscious mind. So we say, well, my wishes of my conscious mind, my, I want to be healthy, I want to have a great relationship, I want a great job. These are the wishes and desires and, and activity that's promoted by the conscious mind. But now we find out that science has revealed that we only operate our lives only about 5% of the time from the conscious mind. 95% of our behavior is unconsciously controlled by habits or programs that we download into the subconscious mind. So which mind is controlling the chemistry of the body? And the answer is 5% of the time you create it with your conscious mind, and 95% of the time you are creating it from the uh, programs that you acquire in your subconscious mind. And, here, and here's where the problem comes from. The fundamental programs in the subconscious mind were downloaded into our brains during the first six years of our lives. Uh, and this was, uh, this was a, a consequence of how the brain was operating. Uh, you can't be conscious, creative, unless you have data. <laughs> so basically, consciousness in a human doesn't even really become a predominant brain activity, uh, and that's measured by EEG, until after six years of age. First six years is download. That's where you get data. Then your consciousness uses the experiences and download and data to formulate how it's going to create a life. Well, here's the point. The fundamental beliefs, then, in the subconscious mind are not even ours. They come from other people. They operate unconsciously. That's why it's called subconscious. We're not even aware of it when we're doing it. And they control 95% of our lives. So are we living the lives that we want? And the answer is actually not really at all, because we're only controlling it 5% of the time to move that way. 95% is the behaviors and beliefs that we acquire during the first six years of our lives playing out as habits and manifesting a life based on those beliefs, not on our creativity. Uh, but, but John, I, I have to tell you something very exciting, because you might say, well, what would happen if I was able to create my life with just my conscious mind instead of using the, the programs in my subconscious mind as the default?